there are no leftover pieces with God, no leftover parts. Everybody has a part and a purpose in God's family. So obviously I have in my future in a couple weeks a whole lot more free time than I've had for a number of years. And so I've been thinking about maybe I should learn to play the oboe. Well, thank you for that encouragement. (laughs) It's evidently good that we're studying about the body of Christ today. I don't know. I'm pretty sure when I said that, some of you went, oh, no, (laughs) not Kent playing the oboe. Well, if you aren't familiar with the oboe, it is a a clarinet kind of like looking instrument. Uh, As I did a little reading about it, I saw that it has a, a double reed instead of a single reed. I do know that there is, there is nothing better than listening to a really, 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 really good oboe player. And there's nothing worse than listening to someone try to play the oboe who doesn't know how to play the oboe. Think of a cat getting its tail run over <laughs> repeatedly. You know? So what's the difference between really, really good oboe players and everyone else? I think we have a a short video that will help us. So I would most likely be the person on the left. I want you to to know that. So when you think about the oboe, the key difference is it it takes perfect coordination and perfect command and perfect control of your whole body. Now, that's probably true for learning to play any instrument well. But with the oboe, it seems like the margin of error is razor thin. You have to have... command over your posture, over your diaphragm, over your lungs, your breath control, all the muscles in your mouth, your lips, your tongue, your cheeks, in addition to having your fingers be able to work well. And if one of your limbs or one of your organs decides to go rogue, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. In this passage this morning, I think Paul is saying some of the similar things about the church, that the church is a body of limbs and organs that must operate in perfect coordination to accomplish the mission that God has given us. So I invite you to take your Bibles. We're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 31. I believe it's page 663 in the Pew Bible ahead of you if you want to grab one of those. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 31. And would you stand in honor of God's word as we read this morning? For just as one, as the body is one, and many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. 
If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care one for another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess the gift of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Join me in prayer this morning. God, I'm grateful for your word. I'm grateful for that the truth that it teaches us and gives us. I'm grateful, God, that even though it was written so, so many years ago, it applies to us today. And so, God, this morning, as we just take a few minutes and look at this passage, would we clearly see the truth of your word? Work in our hearts and in our minds. God, work in my heart and mind. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. What a wonderful design the body is. And Paul is emphasizing that to us this morning in this passage. When, When Jesus called us to himself and redeemed us by faith, he did not save us as a bunch of individual free agents in which it's every man for himself. He purposely saved us in order to join us together in a single body with each believer's unique spiritual gift contributing to the blessedness of others for the growth in the whole church. This morning's passage just establishes that wonderful design and helps us think about the way God has called us to be. It's intended to help us as believers to appreciate what a wonderful thing we are together. And it calls our attention to the wonders of the human body and helps us see how the members of the Church of Jesus work together. Now, I want to go back and look at the first part of the chapter and set up a little bit of what's going on. In verses 1 through 3, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols wherever you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Paul is defining the mission in the church as being the work of the Holy Spirit to work in and through the church to lead other people to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. When we talk about confessing that Jesus is Lord, we're talking about a dependence and an acknowledgement on Jesus and saying that he is Lord over all of the other lords and king over all other kings. In verses 4 through 7, he talks a little bit about the gifts. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit, varieties of service, but the same Lord, varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. So Paul is demonstrating that the mission of the church is accomplished by a mutual, coordinated work of his people. And it's done in and through the three persons of the Trinity. Do you notice the one word in those verses that's mentioned a number of times? Same. The same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God, all working in perfect coordination to carry out this mission. Again, we are not a bunch of independent parts 
that are merely stuck together, each kind of wiggling around, doing its own thing. We are connected to the single dynamic force of Jesus and his work. That's what brings us together in the body of Christ. Ephesians 4, verses 15 through 16 say, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds yourself up, itself up in love. So think again of your body, how marvelous your body is and how things are just joined together so well. Look at your hand, look at your left hand for a minute. I mean, it, it's on the left side of your body, which makes sense, I guess, if it's your left hand. And it purposely works with that side of the body and coordinates with the rest of your body. Now, your right hand is kind of the same, but if, if, if you take your right hand and lay it palm first, on your left hand, you obviously see some differences, don't you? But if you turn it over, you see how closely it's made to work together. That's, that's Paul's point in this chapter. It's an effective illustration of how the church works. It speaks of God's part in working through each of us to be part of the church. And so in the passage this morning, there are just a few things I want to look at real quickly that kind of remind us what the body of Christ is about and maybe even some differences that God brings as well to mold us together. Look at verses 12 and 13. For just as the body is one and many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all made to drink one spirit. So again, different parts of our body, but these different parts are brought together to be one body. Each individual believer in the church family is a unique person with unique gifts, unique personalities, unique backgrounds. And we all have different abilities and different roles to play. But with all of our differences, we are nevertheless formed together into one body just as all of us are formed into one physical body. I would bet this morning, when you greeted someone in church, you didn't say, hello there, all of you individual distinct body parts collected together. You didn't say that, did you? You stuck your hand out and said, good morning. Because yes, we are different body parts and we are distinct but we are one body. How does it happen? Paul simply doesn't say we're united because of sentimental feelings or anything like that. It's because of something that the triune God has done for us that fundamentally unites us into one spiritual union. In verse 13, Paul writes about the Spirit baptizing us into one body. This speaks of the work of the Spirit something called baptism. This isn't talking about the ceremony of baptism that we perform with water. Rather, it's something that the Spirit does, but it is something that baptism in water is meant to symbolize. When we believe on Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the Spirit baptizes us into Jesus once for all time as a spiritual act so that we become permanently with the Lord Jesus in every way. Isn't that great? He forever puts us in Christ. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4 helps us understand this. It says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. So when the Spirit baptizes us into Christ, he permanently places us in Christ. So much so that his death is now our death, his burial is now our burial, and his resurrection is now our resurrection. 
Galatians 3, 27 and 28 says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ. Family, that's how we need to see each other. That's how we need to see ourselves. We need to view ourselves with all of the differences in personalities and spiritual gifts and ethnic backgrounds as now being one in Christ and united into only one body, just as our body parts are united into only one body. But the really cool thing about this is that unity doesn't make us lose our uniqueness, or distinctions. Look at verses 14 through 19. For the body does not consist of one member but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be. If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are one, many parts, yet one body. Paul, I think, illustrates this in a rather humorous way, the variety. If a foot says, I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body. That's wrong, isn't it? Think about that for a minute. The hand is pretty esteemed. It's, it's the first thing we put forward when we meet somebody. I'm glad you didn't put your foot out when you wanted to shake someone's hand this morning. But yet, the hand couldn't do much if the foot wasn't doing its job. Isn't that right? Paul illustrates it again with an eye and an ear. If the ear says, I'm not an eye, it's wrong. You know, when we talk to someone, we tend to look right into their eyes, don't we? When I talk to my wife, I don't do it to her ear. I look at her in the eyes. But if the ear should feel bad because it's not an eye, that doesn't make it less a part of the body. The eye can't really turn around and look at someone when they call to us unless the ear does its job. So Paul is saying that sometimes we tend to look at other people and think that we should have what they have. And he does it, like I said, in a rather humorous way by comparing some of the things. Now, I thought it would really be cool this morning if somehow I could exchange my eye and an ear right in front of you, but I'm... I uh, think that that would probably be rather unhealthy for me to disconnect parts of my body and messy. So I thought we should probably have an illustration of how kind of absurd this looks. So I thought, what better than to illustrate it with Mr. Potato Head? <laughs> now, look at how funny that looks, right? I mean, you got a foot trying to be a hand, and you got eyes trying to be an ear. You know, we chuckle at this, but there's a lot of truth to the fact in how we compare ourselves with other people, isn't there? we tend to look at other people and think what they have is something we should have or want. And God is saying through Paul very clearly today that every part of the body is important. Every part works together. It's rather absurd when we think we have to be like other people. 
Now I'm going to put him away because some of you will, that's the only thing you'll get out of this morning is Mr. Potato Head. And so please move past that, if you would, this morning. And think about the fact that God has united us into one body with different parts. Now I find it interesting that the comparisons we often make are with body parts that are kind of similar, the, the hand and the foot and the eye and the ear. We compare ourselves to someone who maybe is just a little bit more impressive. But family, here's the question I want you to think of this morning. I wonder sometimes if we look at other people in the body and envy their gifts. That's kind of a convicting question, isn't it? Do we look at other people in the body and envy their gifts? Leon Morris, a commentator on this passage, said, we are people prone to envy those who surpass us just a little rather than those who are in a different class. God is saying here, do not envy the gifts of others, and he's also saying, do not demean the gifts that God has entrusted to you. Can I be so bold this morning as to say that when you demean your gift, you criticize God? When you demean the giftedness that God has given you, in essence, you're telling God that he made a mistake. That he didn't give you the right gift. And I believe that it's a sinful attitude that all of us struggle with that robs us of the great joy that we have when we are content with what God has given us. Let's not be bothered by variety. What a horrible thing it would be if you were all like me. God's given variety, and I love the word in verse 18. It says God has arranged things. He's arranged them for how he wants them to be. There's also an interdependency. Look at verses 20 to 22. As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. The human body is bound together in such a way that various parts need other parts to do their work. Again, the eye really can't say, I don't need the hand. The eye can look around see all kinds of things, but it can't do a thing unless the hand's willing to help pick some things up. And it's the same with the, with the head and the foot. The head can think all sorts of thoughts, but it can't get anywhere to do anything about those thoughts without the feet. It's the same in the body of Christ. There are members of the church that seem upfront and more recognizable in what they do. And there are other members in the church family who do things unseen and unrecognized, but without their service, the upfront things would never happen. I think often of the encore group that meets in our church, and they meet for meals. And as soon as we're done eating, one of the participants who has come specifically for that meal gets up, leaves the room, walks into the kitchen. And instead of being in there and enjoying some of the program things that the Encore group is doing, this individual will spend the rest of the time making sure every dish is washed, dried, and put away. And I looked at this individual one day and said, you really have the gift of service. And they, they kind of tried to, yeah, you know, but it's so true. It's so true. There are people all over this church who do things like that. You see me on a Sunday morning, often. But I don't do, and we don't do what happens on the stage without people who are not in the forefront, 
but yet using their giftedness. Paul says that those members of the body which seem weaker are necessary. And that's really true. There's another sense of what this means, just a couple more quick ones, and that's the whole area and thought of nurture. Starting with verse 23, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for each other. In this couple of verses of Scripture, the various parts of the body show loving care for each other. They protect each other. They provide for each other. And in a sense, that protection shows greater honor. It's true with our church, isn't it? There are some of us who provide a much-needed role in the church family. And we protect them and sometimes even preserve them from exposure. There are people who want to serve but who don't need to know or have others know that they are serving. There are many of you who are extremely generous There are many of you who spend time on your knees. You do the things in private, and we are so grateful for that. And Paul says the purpose of it is that we should work hard at unity when unity is often difficult. Paul says we must not divide the body. couple last verses, verse 26. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. You ever stub your little toe in the dark? You ever notice how when you do that, it's more than your little toe that's involved? Most of the time, You've got one hand holding the little toe and your other leg is bouncing up and down and your other hand is looking for something to balance. And I would pretty much guarantee that even your voice is involved in that. It's like your body is one giant stubbed little toe. That's the body of Christ. That's how we come alongside and help people who are hurting. When one's hurting, the whole body feels the pain. We join together to provide comfort. We call out together to God in prayer. And we put our gifts to work in ministering to the need. Church, you guys do that. You'd be amazed at how much and how well and how often the care fund is used to help people who are hurting. You'd be amazed at how many meals are made when someone's just had a baby or surgery or just needs a meal. The Bible also talks in this passage about how we honor people, we rejoice with people. You know, if you're about to graduate from high school in a week or two, chances are that you'll go through some kind of a commencement ceremony, and when you do it, they will not just congratulate your brain. It's a whole body thing. The same is true in the body of Christ. When one experiences victory, the whole body feels joy. Paul sums it up and says, In verse 27, we are individual members. We are are the body of Christ and individual members of it. Paul is kind of putting together the two sides of the imagery that we've just walked through. In one sense, there's the side that we're all collectively the body of Christ. And on the other side, there's the sense that we're individual parts of it. We are the the limbs, the organs, the, the ligaments, the tissues, the joints that hold 
the body together. Romans 12, verses 4 and 5 says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Now Paul goes on in the rest of this chapter, we read it, to list a number of the different gifts that people have. And not wanting to be here till 2.30 this afternoon, I'm going to set that aside for another sermon. But what's the takeaway today? What's the application points that I see from this passage? Number one, submit to God's purposes for your life. Submit to God's purposes for your life. When we demean our own gifts and look with envy on the gifts of others, we're we're saying that we think God has given us something beneath us. Everything God gives is essential to the body of Christ. You ever buy one of those kits? Could be a piece of furniture, could be a model. You you don't, there are a number of different things, but you get it all put together and you have leftover pieces. And you think, what did I do wrong? What did I miss? There are no leftover pieces with God, no leftover parts. Everybody has a part and a purpose in God's family. So if you're the foot, are you serving the body by taking it where it needs to go? If you're the hand, are you serving the body by helping people and doing things? If, if you're an eye, are you, are you looking ahead? Are you seeing what's coming? Are you serving in that way? If you're an ear, are you listening to people around you? Now, you may say, Kent, I don't know what my gift is. I don't know how I can serve. Well, if you have a question about that, as soon as I give the benediction, just make a line right down the center of the sanctuary, and believe me, we will find a place for you to serve. There are lots of places to serve in the church. So the question is, are you submitting to God and serving? Secondly, encourage others to use their gifts. I love to tell people, thanks for serving. There are so many ways to serve. And when we proactively encourage people, it not only encourages them, but it makes us stop for a minute and think about why God has put them in our church. And then we think a little bit more and think, what would our church be like if this person was not using their giftedness. That's a scary thought. Encourage people to use their gifts. When you do that, it gives you a greater appreciation for what God is doing in our church family. You begin to recognize that every person, every gift, every function is indispensable. It's essential. And in fact, when you do that, when you encourage someone you may be helping that person right now if they're struggling with demeaning their own gift. And then lastly, bind up the body of Christ. Look around where you see suffering, step in and help. The body suffers together and it rejoices together. Find ways to share joys and sorrows. Find ways to connect with people. Find ways to connect with people that aren't like you. Find ways to connect with people you don't know. Find ways to help people. Dr. Bradford Reeves shared the following story. His his dad was a beekeeper, and one day he went to his dad's house, and his dad had been in the middle of collecting honey. And so he showed Bradford all the honey he had gotten from the hives, and A lot of it was in five-gallon pails, and as he was taking the covers off of the five-gallon pails, one of them he took off, and there in the top on the honey were three little bees who were struggling. They were covered in sticky honey and drowning. And so Bradford asked his dad, is there any way we could help those bees? And his dad said, well, I'm pretty sure they won't survive. It's just, it's kind of a casualty of, of beekeeping honey collection, I guess. And so he asked, Bradford asked if there was some way, could, could we just scoop them out 
you know. So they scooped them out and found a little yogurt container or something and put them in. And because they were working hives, there were bees all over, and so they had to worry about the bees that were flying outside. And so they left those three little bees on a container on a bench and just kind of figured that was their fate. A little while later, his dad called Bradford over to the bench, and they looked in that container, and those little bees were surrounded by all their sisters. And those bees were cleaning the sticky, nearly dead bees, helping them get the honey off their bodies. And they came back a short time later, and there was one bee left in there, and there was still a group around helping that little bee. Bradford said when it was time to leave, they checked the container one last time, and all of the bees had been cleaned off enough to fly away, and the container was empty. God calls us to be a body. God calls us to use our gifts and to share our gifts with others. Brothers and sisters, what a privilege we have in the body of Christ. Pray that God continues to knit us closer together as the body. Would you join me in prayer? God, it's such a great passage that reminds us that you are the head, you are the head of the body. But God, each one of us plays a vital role to make that body complete. And so God, today, would you help us to just do a little self-examination, even right now, and think about how we're serving with the giftedness that we have. God, there's nobody that's exempted from a gift. God, would you help us to give you the thoughts that we have sometimes in feeling like our gift isn't important? Would you help us to just confess those thoughts to you? God, would you help us to be great encouragers of others that serve? And God, would you give us eyes to continue to look around and see who hurts, who needs a hug, who needs a word of prayer, who needs a meal, who needs help. And likewise, God, to rejoice when there's great joy. Thank you, God, for making us us. In Jesus' name, amen.